Uh, okay, great. So I'm just gonna say a very few words uh, and then we're gonna move on. So when I first started trying to build data science for social impact into our program and into PRISM um, years back, a couple of years back, uh, and I was designing a course and a concentration in this, I thought a lot about my own experiences doing research with people on the ground, um, people who actually were interacting with the human subjects and had thought deeply about substantive areas that I had not thought deeply about because I was just the statistician with the fancy methods. And I also went and talked to people at NGOs and in local federal government um, at foundations, evaluation firms about what they were looking for in employees and what they found lacking, honestly, in who they were hiring. And over and over again, it wasn't that the person didn't understand random forests deeply enough. The problem was they couldn't explain random forests to their boss, right? And they couldn't communicate to stakeholders. And they didn't understand that you might have a variety of stakeholders who had different needs. And that takes a variety of different kinds of skills. And that talking to people on the ground who might be impacted by your work helps you understand the results in a different way, helps you understand your data in a different way, right? And all of these things are really hard to teach in a class. So that's where this, this fellowship was born out of that desire to fill the gap in um, students' understanding that when you're working on a project and actually meeting with the people who are the substantive experts or the local experts, you think about things in a different way and you understand the complexity of the problems um, in a different way. So we're going to get some snapshots of that today with our five different teams and um, we've got Sometimes they'll be represented by the students, sometimes by the PI, sometimes a mix. So our first talk is uh, the, about the THINK project, Tracking Hope in Nairobi and Karachi. Um, the second is uh, a consensus among asset managers on fostering counterintuitive skill development. The third is the jail data initiative. Fourth is Abla Me Bebe um, and nurse family partnership. And the fifth is the segregation of school segregation literature. Uh, so the presenters are gonna introduce themselves to you and tell you a little, just a little bit about their work. And I just wanna thank the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment at NYU for funding this fellowship program. So we are gonna move on to Dorothy Seaman who will be talking about, oops, we didn't need to see that. Who will be talking about the Think Project. Never, does everyone see my screen? We see a message that you've started screen sharing. Okay. So try again. On my side, it looks good. Oh, maybe it's just my internet. I saw it. Um, okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, all right. My name is uh, Dorothy Seaman. I'm a recent graduate from. Um, the plastics program at NYU Steinhardt. And the project that I supported during my fellowship is the Think Project, Tracking Hope in Nairobi and Karachi. And the project is led by Dr. Dana Birdie on the Pakistan side of the project and Dr. Elizabeth King on the Kenya side of the project. And the overarching research question for the study is whether university education changes the tra trajectories or outcomes of youth in Nairobi, Kenya and Karachi, Pakistan. And this is an important research question because both countries are affected by various forms of violence um, and also have high youth populations who are often blamed for that violence. So this study sets out to understand the role of education in building peace in these contexts. And specifically, uh, the research study is interested in understanding um, the impact of university education on hope, agency, pro-social attitudes and behaviors. Uh, the data comes from a three-year longitudinal survey 
of a sample of high school students in Nairobi, Kenya, and applicants to two top universities that we partnered with in Karachi. The study design is a recent discontinuity that's inherent to the admissions process in both countries. So in both countries, high school students take a standardized test and their score on that test determines whether or not they have access to university. Uh, this is a high level timeline of the project for you to get a sense of where in the project I joined um, during my fellowship in 2020. So prior to my joining, the surveys had been um, administered, the data had been prepared and cleaned. So when I started in 2020, the project had a wealth of data. We had 12 found respondents across these three samples and these three surveys. Uh, so my two big buckets of work were uh, analyzing the data and then writing up the findings. And today I want to talk to you um, about my survey or my survey data analysis experience and share with you two stories that I think really highlight the value of the fellowship for me during my graduate studies. And the first story is about the household asset index. Uh, so a little background, um, when the survey was being developed, uh, the research team was interested in having um, a metric as a proxy of socioeconomic status that could be compared between the two countries and also um, wanted to collect information in a way that didn't ask youth to report their household income, because that's just not something that they may know or be, may be able to report um, accurately. Uh, so instead, the study uses um, this question about um, these household items and you select all of the items that they have at the time um, in their household. And that information is used to create an asset index. And the story I wanna share with you um, is about my experience uh, choosing or deciding which imputation strategy was best to use for filling in missing asset data. Um, so the study uses two imputation strategies. One is backward imputation, and a second is a more statistically sophisticated possible imputation method. And I, uh, before joining the project, had come from an education research background only in the United States. Um, so my, my first assumption was that some of these assets may be um, good candidates for backward imputation. Um, and, a, and information that's good to backwards impute is um, are items that are stable over time. For example, like your birth year or the county that you're born in. Um, and coming from a domestic education research context and thinking about particularly in Pakistan with um, applicants to top universities, my first thought was that some of these um, assets would be stable over time. Um, but before going into deciding which strategy to use for imputation, I decided to look at the data just descriptively to see if that assumption was true. Um, it turned out that it was not true for the sample of students that we had in Pakistan. Um, even something like electricity, which we think particularly um, for students that are applying to top universities, they would have stable electricity. We saw in our sample that um, around 20% of students were gaining or losing electricity over time. And our research partners were able to give us more information as to why that might be the case to help us better interpret some of, the, some of these fluctuations that we were seeing. So with regard to electricity, um, in some neighborhoods and households in Karachi, they have uh, scheduled times where they don't have electricity and that might influence some of this instability that we were saying. And I shared this story with you about how valuable it was to look at the descriptive statistics and how important it was to have these insights from the research partners to inform how we imputed a household asset data. Um, because that was a very, that is a very important metric for the study, a proxy of socioeconomic status that we want to use to understand maybe disparities and the impact of university education between um, students who come from a higher or lower socioeconomic background. And the second story that I want to share with you is about um, the regression discontinuity. Um, so when I was performing the analysis, I was comparing students who scored just above um, the test score threshold are just below. So these uh, blue students and red students in the plot. Um, and we, for those of you who are familiar with the regression discontinuity method, we used um, an algorithm to select um, the ideal number of students on either side of the threshold to compare. We also ran the analysis on all the imputed data sets. 
And I say that because the analysis was very statistically sophisticated. Um, and when we shared the results with our research partners, they were as interested in the descriptive statistics that we provided, which revealed high treatment noncompliance. And so what that means is um, the students who are depicted in red in this plot, who based on their test score should not have had access to university, uh, were reporting attending university anyway. And our research partners in Nairobi were able to give us some context as to why we were seeing this treatment noncompliance. So at the same time um, that the study was starting, universities in Nairobi were offering students um, shorter, like maybe one or two year diploma programs, in addition to offering these four year degree programs that require a certain test score to attend. And we were able to use some information in, in the survey and look at university websites to confirm that um, a big reason we were seeing this non-compliance was because youth were attending, youth below the test score threshold were attending diploma programs. Um, and I, again, I share this story to highlight the importance of the descriptive statistics and the value of having a research partner flag that for us and provide this additional context, both so we could kind of tweak and update the, um, our analyses to account for this treatment noncompliance, but also is really helpful to understand what youth who did not have access to four-year degree program, programs were doing instead. And so my big takeaways from my experience were um, to see firsthand the importance of the having a local research partner um, and the importance of using descriptive statistics alongside these more statistically sophisticated methods. Um, and I chose these two elements to share with you today because as we talked about both a lot of graduate school um, coursework, but they're not um, conducive to learning in a classroom in the same way that, you know, we may learn a machine learning algorithm or regression modeling. Um, so this fellowship, I'm really grateful to have this fellowship to be able to take these more abstract ideas and really internalize them and see the importance of um, research partnerships and descriptive, descriptive statistics in this way. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you to the Morris Sloan Data Science Environment for funding the fellowship and thank you all for listening. Thanks, Dorothy. That was wonderful. Really great. Um, does anyone have a quick question while we transition to the next group? Not seeing. Okay, I think we're gonna move along then to, uh, I think George and Tracy. All right, hi everyone. Um, just to uh, check, can everybody see my screen and, and hear me clearly? Okay, excellent. So um, today I'm really gonna be talking about the breadth of opportunities this program has, has allowed me to work on um, while I was a student and kind of the value of how our program helped with that and also how it, um, my experience in the fellowship expanded my skills as an applied statistician and just applied researcher in general. And so I'm really calling today um, Data Science for Social Impact, and it's really a story of two projects for me. Um, the primary project I'm going to talk about is, or the first project, whoops, um, is this idea of ESG as a counterintuitive skill set. Um, uh, why is my slides going in reverse? Um, okay, sorry, we're having some screen share issues. It wouldn't be an event if there weren't technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so the first project is this idea of ESG investing as a counterintuitive skill. And this is the primary project that I worked on in the beginning, beginning of the program. Um, and so as a quick, brief, brief, brief overview about what environmental, social, and governance investing is, is it's the idea of kind of bridging um, sustainability into the traditional finance sector. And there's this idea that grew over time that companies that um, are thinking of environmental issues, social issues, and governance issues actually in the long run um, are going to financially outperform those that don't. I mean, finding ways to quantify these ideas is important in advancing environmental, social, and governance outcomes and also continuing um, 
financial gain as well. Think of the ideal as if a company has a big oil spill, that's not just bad for the environment, it's also bad for a company's economic standing. And this is a way to kind of align incentive structures. Um, and so the key questions I was, was addressing was um, how do finance professionals um, make ESG investment decisions in practice? Um, these people take a lot of quantitative information, um, but as I'll get into in a second, this information really isn't enough. Um, and there's a lot of other skills that are needed, particularly um, emotion and, and other things that aren't thought of in the traditional hard finance kind of roles. Um, and then ESG is, a, is confusing in practice and um, understanding the role of emotion among these professionals is a really underexplored space. And then we are also seeking to identify what are kind of um, expertise that exists in this space. Are there, are there traits or skills that some professionals are using that are separating them um, from other ESG investment professionals? And so the idea of an ESG rating is there are companies that exist that try to rate other companies in terms of their environmental, social, and governance impact. Um, but these ratings can have a lot of challenges. Um, they're created internally um, at these kind of big asset management organizations or externally from these companies that exist just to make these things. Um, some give letters, some give numbers, some just say good, bad, medium. Um, there's a lot of confusion about what these things mean. It's a very, very early space. And um, people, there is a lot of qualitative work going on in parallel to this project that investigated how people actually use these things, if they're reliable, if they're relying more on their own personal skills. Um, this is just an example on the right of what some of these things would look like. This is uh, publicly available from one of the big premier ESG rating agencies. Um, and there's been a lot of work in the literature looking at um, these big agencies' ratings don't actually align with one another. Um, and so there still is a lot of confusion, which raises this idea of actual people working in the field using these other skills, um, basically using um, more like what we consider more emotional skills when interacting with these companies and um, the C-suite of these companies to decide how, uh, how their ESG standing should be assessed. Um, and so specifically my role is um, to get a better insight into, into ESG professionals across the field instead of just qualitative interviews. Um, we wanted to create a survey that could be um, easier to scale and get more of a broader, broader and wider net. Um, and so I worked on developing a 50 item survey, um, conducted cognitive interviews on that survey with people in the field and parallel to the field. Um, conducted some simulation work to inform power analyses and kind of visualizing different competing hypotheses and assisted in writing a full NSF grant proposal that was submitted this August. Um, this is a broad set of skills that we use to apply to research and, um, and kind of the different areas you would work as a statistician. Um, and personally, something I was the most excited to learn about was this idea of a cultural consensus analysis. Um, it's a type of data analysis that I had not been exposed to before coming into this project. <clears throat> and it's basically a way of how do you, you have all this data, you have all these survey responses, <clears throat> and how do you measure what people agree on and how they don't? Um, how do you see if there are clusters of people within these responses um, that you can tie to expertise or outcomes that are associated with a big success? Um, where do people agree on, in this case, ESG investment, where they disagree? Um, and so this is really, I would think of it from a stats angle as more of like an unsupervised machine learning problem. Um, there's really no direct outcome. It's not regressing X on Y and, and looking at your coefficients, but finding um, clusters within the data that are meaningful um, and actually distinct from noise. Um, it's also particularly effective when there are small sample sizes um, and multivariate problem sets. Um, and so like personally, this is an area of extreme growth for me. Um, and this is just a little example of how this type of problem set can be used. Um, this is some simulation work I did to basically show how different hypotheses could play out in practice. Um, we hypothesized that there were groups of finance professionals who are experts and non-experts, um, and that experts would score in certain areas in the survey different. That's kind of shown at the bottom where there'd be a consensus among experts and people who are non-experts would be kind of just guessing at the various items in the survey. Um, but there could sometimes hypotheses play out in different ways. It could be that this expertise hypothesis didn't show and there was an agreement across everybody on kind of the middle chart, or there was really no agreement among anyone, which would love kind of the, the top chart situation. 
this is this is really really high level of um, the applications of this method, um, but I don't have the time to go into all of the nuance of it. And now I'm just going to give a super super brief through of kind of this other project I was able to work on during the fellowship um, that was funded by a. I'm going to skip through this stuff because I'm mindful of time. Um, an NSF rapid grant looking at kind of predictors of restaurant resilience amid uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Once again, um, really really high level here. I'm just trying to get at the broad breadth of, of work the fellowship is allowed. And this is also a joint work. Um, it was a three-site study um, at New York University, University of Florida, and Arizona State, basically looking at restaurants in all of these places. Um, I'm going to glance over this, but we had kind of multiple neighborhoods within each, uh, within each city. In New York, we are concerned with Chelsea and Jackson Heights, Corona, North Corona, and Elmhurst, areas in Queens. So getting at kind of the big Manhattan tourist central part and the more local areas. Um, which had very, very different experiences with coronavirus. Um, similar in Arizona, we were in Scottsdale, a very kind of urban and touristy place, and then Chandler, more suburban. And then in Florida, we were looking specifically at Gainesville. Um, and so my role was developing a survey that would be used to get um, data from existing restaurant owners to understand um, aspects of their resiliency and we were, um, resiliency, and in particular resiliency related to the supply chain. Um, I also needed to, to do a lot of work around developing a sampling frame because there's not a list of restaurants in the phone book you can call. And then um, finally, some data management and data cleaning. Um, yeah, as I talked about, um, the survey ended up having seven distinct sections. Um, because this doesn't exist, we really had to develop our measures and then appropriately pilot test those. Um, and the, type, the nature of the work we're doing is inherently reactive. And so the survey was set up in such a way um, that it was heavily branched and depending on your experience it, it would kind of bring you down on um, the appropriate follow-up questions. There's a lot of technical work that went into creating an instrument that could be scalable and reach the needs of the research team. Um, as for the sampling frame, we ended up using Yelp um, at each of the sites to identify lists of restaurants. But the problem with this is this is not a particularly useful format to um, draw a random sample from. Um, so I web scraped Yelp and to create these nice little CSVs that we could apply random sampling from. We random sampled um, 50 sites per, per area that we selected from this kind of broader list of restaurants and this was used to inform our, our interviews. Um, and then finally, as we've talked about a lot, um, Real data is very messy. Um, this is just some pilot data we had um, from some early interviews. As you can see, there is 1,741 variables. Um, due to the kind of branch nature of the survey, there's a lot of work that went into cleaning this whole situation. Um, and this is really where the lessons I've learned in graduate school came in. Um, I can't really give an overview of each of these courses, but the web scraping from messy data machine learning, kind of the benefits of working with stakeholders um, and uh, qualitative researchers that I learned in data science for social impact, and then the pilot testing and cognitive new skills that I learned in Daphne's survey development course have all been essential to my entire experience in this fellowship. Um, and I really would not be able to, uh, to create the work I've done without the skills I learned in these courses. And then finally, um, I just wanna say thank you to the more the Morris Sloan Data Science Environment for funding my fellowship and my work. I also want to thank uh, Tracy Van Holt, who is my supervisor and PI on all of the projects. Um, the postdoc, Tamar Gross, who did kind of the qualitative work that really informed a lot of the survey development for the, um, the ESG research I did. And then Jennifer Ellen Mark Scott um, at PRISM. And then um, I do have, if, do I do, if we do have any time left, um, I'm happy to take any questions or anything like that. We could have a very quick question um, while uh, the jail data initiative is queuing themselves up um, or people can put questions in the chat. I've seen some things in the chat and you can respond in the chat. Does anyone wanna ask a quick question? Okay, we're gonna move on to jail data initiative and um, but hoping some conversations can also happen in the chat. Okay, great. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm Anna Harvey um, from the Public Safety Lab. Um, our uh, social data um, initiative 
fellow was Chutang Luo, who is um, currently in China and sends her regrets for not being able to be with us today. But I have brought Orion Taylor. Um, Chutang is a student in the um, uh, Master's in Data Science program over in CDS. Um, and so is Orion. And Orion started working with us on the Jail Data Initiative, also as a more Sloan Data Science Environment um, Fellow. Um, and so um, he will be able to talk about what it's like to work on the project as a student. And um, I'm going to turn it over to him. And before I do so, I just want to say thank you to Jennifer and Prism and the More Sloan Data Science Environment for supporting the project. Um, this is really a student, a student led and student executed project. And um, it's been, uh, I think, productive both for us and for the, the advocacy community and the research community. And we're really grateful for the support. So, Ryan. You want to take it away? Hello. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. All right. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the project and then about what Chu Tang worked on, uh, which is also what I worked on. Um, so the Jail Data Initiative is a, a grant-funded project to collect daily jail roster data from as many places reported in the country. Um, so this is from the Prison Policy Initiative, which is an advocacy group. Um, they put out statistics like this periodically. Uh, a lot of their data is based on very old information at this point, because there's not really a source for uh, daily jail data or jail data for the entire country um, in existence, including the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is a government and, uh, organization which is supposed to collect some statistical information related to this, but doesn't do a great job. Uh, so you can sort of see this the scale of this. There are a lot of people in local jails at any given time. Uh, if we zoom in here, um, it's like almost a million people per year on average per day. And then the foot traffic in and out of jails is a bag, order of magnitude greater than this. Um, so this is a very relevant, important project in the United States um, to be able to look at this data. So. Uh, a lot of policy making is sort of empirically substantiated, but again, without data to, to help with that, uh, a lot of decision making is stymied. So we want to look at things like the impacts of pretrial detention. Um, there is some uh, research out there to suggest, for instance, that pretrial pre detention could actually increase recidivism rates, um, which is not obviously a goal for public safety. So uh, we're we were hoping to fill in the gaps by getting jail data from smaller locales within the United States, because these studies usually focus on individual cities. Uh, so yeah, again, no large scale detainee level data, and this uh, inhibits these types of questions. So the jail data initiative, there's a little map on the right, was basically a giant web scraping project to begin with. So when I started out, we were just building individual web scrapers for every jail roster we could find for the whole country. Uh, you can see sort of in green what we've been able to fill in. Uh, a lot of the country, about two thirds of the counties in the United States do not report any sort of jail roster, um, but this is what we have to work with. So data collection. This is uh, the bulk of our work over the past year and what Chu Tang helped us with over the summer and in the fall. Um, every jail roster reports information completely differently. They report different fields. Some of them are PDFs. Some of them are require like dynamic web scraping with something like Selenium, which is a Python package that basically emulates a human web browser, et cetera. So uh, for about a thousand jail rosters, uh, a lot of our work was creating these relatively robust web scrapers that would hold up over time and then schematically unifying data across this entire universe. So here are just a couple of examples. Uh, yeah, so building and debugging. When Chu Tang joined us, we built most of the web scrapers. There were some that uh, we had her help with building to get a sense of our, our framework, which was like an object-oriented Python framework, right? Um, jail raster scrapes break very frequently. So another thing we had to sort of jump into was debugging web scrapes. Uh, it's something tricky because you're working as part of a team, which we're fairly decentralized. And also um, you have to be able to jump in fairly quickly because we don't want to lose too much data at any given time. Uh, second thing obviously is the data structuring I mentioned. So we wanted to put all of these different fields into a single framework so that we could actually analyze data, right? So if somebody's reporting a booking date and then somebody else is reporting an admission date, are these the same field or not, things like that. 
Um, and this requires a little bit of domain knowledge, which is not something you normally dig into in like an educational situation. And then implementing and implementing this pipeline, a pipeline, sorry, at scale. So we had to use uh, AWS originally, Amazon Web Services, large uh, set of services to help run all of this every day to churn out this data, basically. Uh, so here are just some more examples of like where we had to work. Basically, we centralized everything in Airtable. Uh, this is like an example of the class framework in which we built some of these scrapes, just to give a sense. Uh, and this is sort of like visualization of schematic reconciliation. So based on one of those rosters, we wanted to put things into uh, a unified framework, right? So some fields are many to one per person in jail, like charges and bonds. They don't necessarily map. We have to keep all of this in mind as we're building the scrapes, essentially. Uh, some other like... Uh, things required, I guess, data context uh, as we're building these. So like individual privacy, right? Um, all of these are technically publicly available jail rosters, but we don't want to be putting out this information, which we've assembled into a much more usable format. Um, reporting error, error derived from code also. So like deciphering what a field means in different cases. So, you know, if a field status has any of these variety of different values, what does that actually mean? And how do we codify that? Um, and then, you know, just looking for data error, fairly frequent, unfortunately, in this data. But if you see like a murder charge classed as a misdemeanor, is that correct? You know, do we have to go in in this particular scrape and do something, et cetera? Um, and then, this is something kind of funny we've been dealing with a lot more lately, but uh, sort of reconstructing reconstructing the cultural insensitivity that goes into the uh, documenting of this data. So, um, you know, if we want to report on racial or ethnic uh, breakdowns of, of jail data, like most jail rosters aren't necessarily distinguishing that Hispanic is an ethnicity and not a race. Uh, sex and gender are also often conflated on these data. So just having these kinds of things in mind as you were working on web scraping uh, is kind of important to be able to produce any insights from the data. Uh, there are some machine learning use cases as well. Uh, it's largely a data collection project, but in some cases, if you have to crack a CAPTCHA, for instance, you have to use optical character recognition um, for field classification. So the set of different charge strings in this whole universe is very broad. Um, and so uh, we need like a classification model in order to categorize charges essentially. Um, so just being aware of this model as it's in use, uh, feedbacking into it, making sure that we're actually getting correct categories, things like that are some of the machine learning use cases here. Uh, and then one specific uh, thing I'll highlight that happened a lot during Chu uh, Tang being with us last summer is COVID ramped up and there was a lot more interest garnered in like jail data since we were basically the main source of like daily jail population data. Um, so the corrections populations by age, you can see there's still a lot of older people in jail. That was a priority earlier on in COVID was uh, depopulating jails as much as possible because they tend to be uh, hot spots for COVID that tend to be. Um, so because of our data, we were able to aggregate, for instance, to get a daily U.S. jail population among various set, subsets of counties, right? So this is a fairly small subset, but you can see a pretty dramatic depopulation effort happening specifically after a federal directive was um, produced in March of last year. Uh, uh, kind of another like example of a research question, basically using this COVID data, we were able to treat this specific federal guideline on March 16th of last year as like a temporal shock and do uh, conduct a, a regression discontinuity in time, similar to the previous presentation, um, assuming that the populations were fairly similar around this date. Um, if they, if the their demographics or you know anything else about them, their their main charge types like or like felony versus misdemeanor, for instance, if there was a shift in the percentages of these populations released, you would assume that you would see a corresponding shift in recidivism rates, right? So if they're releasing more, quote, dangerous detainees, then you'll see higher recidivism rates from that population. Uh, conversely, if you don't see that, then maybe there was no public safety served by uh, incarcerating these people pre-trial in the first place. 
this is an example of an insight related to that that we saw um, in terms of how released populations changed over time during COVID. Uh, more white people, not surprisingly, perhaps were released than Black Hispanic uh, during that sort of release window of four to six weeks after this federal directive. Uh, and then this is just wrap up personal comments. Hopefully, True Ten can synthesize with some of these. But uh, Anna gave us this opportunity, luckily, as students, to be able to work on a project like this that's fairly scaled um, and complex. Uh, so my personal take: there were, you know, went to a research fair, and there were not that many like socially conscious projects around necessarily. Um, a lot of the CDS curriculum is geared towards getting you into uh, corporate jobs, which is fine um within that context i think you're sometimes sort of siloed uh, i know a lot of my classmates are working on very specific tasks every day um this project i hope for Tang and definitely for me gave like a broad scope of like what the actual data science pipeline looks like from start to finish um and then of course there's this quip always that 80 percent of data science is data collection and cleaning um, and I think it's sort of hard to really understand that until you fully get into the weeds on a project like this, which is ongoing every day. And thank you to the Morse Sloan Data Science Environment because they funded me at first and they funded you too. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Amazing work. It's really inspiring. Uh, okay, in the interest of time, we're going to move right along to Abame Bebe. So, Natalie and John, you guys ready? Can you uh, see the sharing uh, screen and hear my voice? Yes, we can. Good. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Zheng, uh, and he is my uh, mentor, uh, Natalie Brito. We are here presenting a study examining uh, associations among paid family leave and infant neural cognitive outcomes. Um, so I'm going to present a little bit and just to clarify that the title doesn't match exactly what we're doing because due to COVID, um, the other project data collection did not happen. And so, and John's uh, joined my team in March. So this is a very, very short time frame. And so we uh, settled on a different uh, policy related question. Um, so for a bit of background, unlike the majority of the world, the United States is one of five countries highlighted in red, as well as the only high income country that does not have a national policy mandating paid leave to working women who give birth. Go to next slide. And we know that in the US, there are a lot of working caregivers, right? So around 61% of mothers in married couple households and 68% of mothers in single parent households with children under the age of six um, are employed. And so right now, federal policy allows caregivers to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave, um, but often caregivers are unable to take this time off due to financial constraints or societal norms and stigma around taking this time off. Uh, next slide. Um, but we know from like a very interdisciplinary uh, perspective that this time off is often really crucial for mothers because they're dealing with a host of issues, including post-birth complications, lactation difficulties, sheer exhaustion, I know for a lot of the moms who are attending right now, um, and even postpartum depression. And what's really crucial is that this stressful experience for the mother is occurring at a time when infants are supposed to be developing their key neural connections in the brain that's supposed to be developing within the context of early social interactions. Next slide. Um, and so within the literature, you know, the positive effects of paid maternal leave um, has been documented, you know, with uh, maternal mental health or continued breastfeeding and even subsequent economic gains. Um, but there's very, very little within the United States linking paid uh, family leave or maternal leave to infant outcomes. And so there's one study um, that was conducted in my lab that examined the associations between paid maternal leave and infant outcomes in the U.S. Um, and so this had 446 mothers. They were retrospectively interviewed, though, when the children were 24 and 36 months old. And then there were parent report measures of infants' general cognitive, linguistic, and socio-emotional skills. Next slide. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a little bit of snapshot of what we found previously, but then really let John take over to what he's been working on. 
Um, and so in this particular analysis, controlling for things that we find to be very important, like infant age, gestational age at birth, infant sex, family income, and maternal education, um, we did see a significant difference in language scores between infants who um, had mothers with paid time off in comparison to infants whose mothers had unpaid time off after giving birth. Next slide. Um, but this is what I think is really key. So interestingly, uh, when we look at socio-emotional skills, there is still a main effect of paid leave, but this was really driven by mothers from lower SES households. So we can think about, you know, who would benefit more from having some financial security during this potentially stressful perinatal period, and really not just financial stability, but really time to devote um, to their infant when foundational cognitive skills are being established. So it may be that paid leave is beneficial overall, but very much so to families at the lower end of the SES spectrum. Next slide. Now, paid leave is currently a hot topic, and it was even promoted during Biden's address to Congress last month. Um, but the currently proposed plan is advocating really for minimum. It may not include all working. So the study that I just described to you is retrospective, relied on parent report measures. And so I'm going to hand it off to John. He's going to tell you about the analysis that we just started and give you some preliminary uh, results. Um, and we're trying to work to address some of these limitations. Thank you. Uh, what we did here is to analyze data from a study called Stress Home Environment Language and Learning uh, Shell to test if experienced uh, of pay leave have significant association with infant brain activity at a three months of age. We have around 100 families participating in this study. In the sample we got, we exclude several uh, observations without three months with the data or without uh, leave information or due to twin babies. So we have 98 observations left in total. Uh, we have 33 moms self-classified as white. 17 uh, self-classified as Black, 9 uh, self-classified as Asian, 1 uh, self-classified as Native, and 36 self-classified as other. Sample is diverse with regards to the race uh, and ethnicity. 60% self-reported as Hispanic or Latino. 40% would be categorized as living in a lower income household. So uh, when their infants were three months old, mother completed a survey asking them several uh, demographic questions and specific questions about their household income, uh, level of education, no attainment, and whether they have been paid or unpaid time off after giving birth. This was the categorical measure uh, of pay leave. We also had a continuous measure of pay leave where mothers indicated how much of their income was paid during their maternal leave, ranging from zero to 100%. Uh, additionally, infant EEG, a marker of brain function, was recorded in the lab at MRU and a hair sample from the uh, mothers to assess maternal hair cortisol. A marker of uh, chronic stress was also collected. So um, with this data set, we asked several questions to ourselves. Uh, is there any association between SDS, family income, or maternal education, and infant brain function assessed via EEG? <coughs> uh, is there any association between the pay leave uh, described either categorically or continuously and infant brain function? Uh, is there any association between maternal physiological stress uh, reflected via maternal hair cortisol and infant brain function? And with these questions in mind, we also include age, uh, sex, and gestational age at birth as, co uh, as the uh, covariate of interest. So uh, we have several things to share. Uh, the first thing is uh, we found that there is no significant association between SDS, uh, family income, or maternal education and infant brain function in any uh, EEG uh, frequency. And uh, we also found that a significant association between pay leave, both categorical and continuous, and infant brain function or frontal uh, for frontal alpha power. This graph shows uh, pay leave uh, categorically. In past research, the frontal high alpha EEG frequency has been linked to attention uh, during infancy. And uh, finally, uh, we don't have results to show you, but we are currently running an uh, analysis examining how maternal hair cortisol levels may interact with pay leave 
to predict brain function, we hypothesize that hay leaf may be more important within environments of high stress than environments of low stress. And uh, this pre uh, primary, uh, preliminary findings will add to the limited literature on the potential benefits of hay family leaf for trial development. And uh, above are pretty much what I have done in the last two months and I started the project in the middle of the March. Uh, in this period, I learned how to do structural equation modeling through package Levon. I learned of the uh, operation of EEG and some background information about developmental cognitive neuroscience. And I also applied my training skill in which I studied from APSR, uh, understanding the coding uh, regression survey uh, and making cross, etc. And uh, thank you all for your attention. I would also like to thank Jennifer, Mark, and Sharon for the help provided in my research. And a special shout out to the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment for funding our research. Oops. Fantastic. Uh, it's great to see that you've accomplished so much in such a short period of time. Um, we kept delaying the start of the project for Natalie in the hope that the, the human subjects research would start back up again. But, you know, it's, it's been a slow process. Uh, okay, in the interest of time, I think we are going to move to our last um, project. Ying, are you going to be presenting? Uh, I think Eva will do most of the presentation okay. here, but I'll, I'll introduce him and also sure. our project a little bit. Hello everyone, I'm Ying Lu. I'm an associate professor in applied statistics and I'm faculty at the PRISM Center. And uh, I'm one of the, uh, uh, so uh, thank you for the PRISM, the Data Science for Social Impact project that we get to work with our brilliant uh, data science student, Eva Ikawain. Did I say your last name correctly, Eva? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, we are an uh, uh, interdisciplinary team. As I introduce myself, I'm, uh, I'm in the field of uh, applied statistics. And these days, I also started doing more education policy. And there are two other professors can't make it today. Uh, professor LaRue uh, Louise McCoy, who's a professor in the sociology of education. And then Professor Sonia Hosford, she's at the TC. In her field is crit critical race theory and education policy. And uh, just a little bit background. So uh, a couple of years ago, when uh, LaRue gave a short presentation at the Steinhardt faculty meeting about uh, uh, inequities in academic, I think, and he, was, he mentioned about the, the, the disproportional uh, citation rates among black scholars. And that's when he and I started talking. And then also Sonia on the separate like a couple of years ago and she started another project on this related topic as a basically uh, just addressing, lo looking at, right, even how, how the, uh, in the academic, how the narratives and also the power of discourse has been very white centered. And then if you look at, right, the most uh, famous scholars and also top cited work, they tend to be all from uh, white faculty members and especially white males. So in this context, and there's also been, you know, anecdotal discussions in social media and the, the movements among black scholars about, uh, you know, bringing more awareness and the citing black scholars work. So this is in the context and the, the three of us and Eva, right? So we decide to, to, to look into a more evidence in the data space. And in this case, that kind of started this project. And, uh, Anyway, so we are over, we, we got funded by the DSDSI uh, project uh, last summer and then ever get continue working on it during the fall 2020. And we just presented our outcomes at AERA uh, 2021 annual meeting. So uh, now I'm gonna uh, hand over the, the microphone to Eva and <laughs> he will show off our, our uh, research outcomes. And thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ying. So I'll share my screen. Uh, this let me know if you can see what I'm sharing. Can you see my screen? Yep. 
Okay, so let's present it. All right, so we'll be talking about the politics of citation in school segregation research. And we'll be looking at it from a literature analysis perspective. So on this project, like uh, Professor Ying talked about, uh, was Professor Peru, Louis McCoy, Professor Ying, myself, and then Professor Sonia Douglas Hosford. Now let's dive in to the purpose of the research itself. So looking at the, you know, the way the entire world is right now, there's so much uh, going on in terms of race, in terms of segregation, in terms of diversity and, you know, stuff along those lines. So, but what we wanted to do in this research is to look at the politics of citation in school segregation research. Now, the focus here is to look at the researchers' ontology, epistemology, racial identity, and how the racial identity and all this inform the research literature on school segregation. So the ultimate question here that we want to answer is, among the researchers who are studying school desegregation, how are they themselves segregated in their approach to research? Now, this is, this is pretty much important because the, uh, the reason why we picked this part is these are the advocates of a desegregated research uh, environment or scholarly uh, work where race shouldn't be a factor in you know, citing or in whatever research someone is doing. So we picked this aspect because it's going to give us a lot of more insights if there is this unconscious uh, bias in terms of race or racial identity on how our researchers pursue their research. So we, we limited our focus to that community that is studying segregated practices and those that are demanding uh, jurists, policymakers and practitioners, you know, to dismantle this uh, racial biases. So our theoretical framework is pretty much based on uh, critical race theory, uh, and some case studies uh, from most of these popular authors. Uh, so moving forward to our approach. Now, our approach in this research is, is the two focused approach, right? The first is the quantity approach and the second is the quality approach. And we're going to dive in more details uh, in the next couple of slides. So on the quantity side of things, we wanted to identify certain journals that are, you know, publishing uh, articles and want to be able, uh, want to be sure that we covered a good number of authors that are publishing uh, scholarly work in this field. And then we also wanted to identify data sources with reliable data uh, regarding the kind of work we want to pursue. And most importantly, we want to be able to design some sort of uh, iterative system of uh, fetching this data from uh, those databases. And then the next step, which is the qualitative bit, is to be sure that among the researchers, uh, the publications that we identify, that they are relevant to the research that we are actually doing. And this is where we had a lot of expert help from our Professor uh, Sonia Hoshford and Professor Louis McCoy, because this is a field that they have been studying for a very long time. So they had expert opinion in terms of what is relevant and what it's not. So moving forward to the data. Now, uh, first we had a lot of challenge in trying to get a list of, you know, our journal articles that fit the kind of research that we wanted to do. Uh, we explored a lot of, a lot of, uh, data sources, uh, Web of Science, Corpus, JSTOR, uh, and of course, Crossref. So we were able to, you know, initially sample a lot of data from this. And then we, we just like I mentioned previously, we adopted a, an expert a computer iterative approach where we are, uh, you know, we had to crawl most of the, uh, databases are uh, some of them that we have direct access to. We could query them uh, directly. 
some that we don't have a lot of access to, we have to pull them manually. So what we're able to do is that for each, uh, each query that will produce results, to kind of review these results with the help of the expert to see, okay, this is relevant, this is not, this is relevant, and this is not. Then at the end of the day, we'll try to make the process a lot more automated uh, with time. And now the next uh, data that we were able to get is data from the Census Bureau. Now, this data is what will help us map uh, the race of a certain person, uh, given that, given what the assigning is, right? So from, from the census data, we're able to pull the demographic of surnames, we're able to get over 160,000 surnames, and then we're able to get the percentage of the racial group based on the surname that was reported on the census data. So for example, in the 2010 census, uh, we found that a lot of people, uh, over 87% of people with surnames like Washington were black and, uh, you know, and a lot of uh, people, uh, a few number of people with our surname uh, like Washington as well, 5.2% uh, of them were white. So this was the basis of how we calculated uh, race likelihood. And we're also going to see more of that in the next couple of slides. So at the end of the day, technically what we are trying to look at is what is the relationship between the citation and publication pattern of an author and the author's race likelihood for all the researches that they publish uh, talking about school segregation. So moving forward, uh, by the time we calculated the race likelihood for all the different surnames and the census, uh, data, we're able to come up with this and we ranked the, this is the first uh, 10,000, a most popular 10,000 surname, and then we rank them and decreasing uh, uh, likelihood of the black uh, community. So what we saw is that given that you're, uh, for anybody with a son in Washington, you're 87% likely to be black and you're 5.8% likely to be white. If your surname is Jefferson, you're 74% likely to be black and you're 17.5% likely to be white. So this is how we are able to come up with a uh, race likelihood for uh, a person's surname. Now, the next thing that we then did is to, to look at uh, a summary of everything that we actually put in in this analysis. So after considering all the, uh, all the different data sources, we're able to pick out our 34 journals, right? And this 34 journals is based on our expert recommendation as, as well as based on our a mixed computer expert approach. So this 34 journals span across education, sociology, anthropology, political science, and public policy. So because what we are, what we are focusing on is, a, is interdisciplinary, right? Uh, because you have school segregation research uh, published across different disciplines. Uh, it's also important that we span our research across those disciplines as well, not just, you know, focusing on just one aspect. And uh, at the end of the day, we were able to settle down with uh, sources uh, from Scopus, data, so, uh, data from Scopus. And this was how we were able to structure most of the queries that we ran to pull this data. Then at the end of the day, we were able to come up with uh, 6,640 peer-reviewed journal articles uh, from a total of 10,500 authors. Now, among these uh, articles and these authors, right, there, there were citation data sets that also cited uh, about 411,000 other articles and also 244,000 other authors. So the interesting part is among the 10,000 authors that we have in the original core data set, we are able to identify the, uh, uh, the risk likelihood of the assigning of about 87, uh, sorry, 82% of them, which is uh, a lot. So, so this could help us map the racial identity of, of uh, 80% of all the authors in the core data set. And this was really huge. Now, the next slide I'm going to show is 
the number of articles that we're able to pull from most of the journals. Uh, so most of these are for people in the space, these are most of the very popular, highly impactful journals across the board. Most of them have been, you know, publishing articles for over a century and, and uh, some of them more recently. So moving forward, uh, these are the, some of our top cited uh, authors that we identified across all those journals. Now, uh, looking at this, we might not be able to see something really quickly, but when we did further analysis, we were able to come up with something that was shocking and I'm going to show you in a bit. So what you're seeing here is the citations and the race likelihood of the surnames. And this was where we were stunned by the results that we saw. So each dot uh, on the x-axis, what you're seeing is the race likelihood of a certain uh, author. And then on the white axis, so what you're looking at is the number of citations uh, of, of a certain author. Now, each dot on this screen identified a single publication or a single citation uh, for a person. Now, what you're seeing is that a lot of the dots are concentrated uh, to the left, right? And we summarize each of these for both white and black authors. Now, as you're looking at the dots, the black line uh, summarizes all the, the plots for the white authors, while the red line summarizes all the plots for the black authors. Now, if you look at the line, you see that the black line kind of, you know, slightly tends to move up as a person's our surname is more likely to be white, right? So a zero here means that this person's surname is 0% likely to be white, while a hundred here means this person is definitely white. Whereas a black here uh, for, the, for the red line means this person is definitely not black, while a hundred here means this person is definitely black. Now, what you see is that as a person tends to be black, the chances that they're going to be cited kind of starts dropping considerably. And what you're also seeing is that as a person tends to be white, the chances that they're going to be cited kind of starts going up, you know, slightly. So this is the moment of truth for us in the research. Again, uh, uh, we are still going to need to do a lot more to find out why this is the case, but this result is kind of shocking. And I'm going to go into the specifics of the numbers uh, here. You know so, what, Eva? Um, can I interrupt you? Um, we're like six minutes over. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, um, be... It's so interesting and I want to hear more, but I also know that people have to move on to other meetings. All right, all right. So I'm going to wrap up in like three minutes. So, so this is the summary of the results that we found. On average, each author of the data set has about 70 citations and the median citation for each author is 15. And then uh, in summary, everything that we saw is that as the likelihood of someone being black increases by 10%, the citation rate reduces by 2.89. And as the likelihood of someone being white is, is uh, increases by 10%, the likelihood of their, sorry, uh, their likelihood uh, that they will, be, uh, sorry, their citation rates will decrease by 1.9%. So this is the summary of everything we saw in the previous slide. Uh, below On the table below is, you know, more details of, of that. So this is what we took out from this. And this is more like uh, an eye opener, essentially, that there is actually racial bias in people that are actually trying to write scholarly work that will reduce uh, racial bias. So this is a, uh, how authors collaborate. If you look at this, you're going to see that there's uh, what we call uh, cohorts, like right? uh, authors kind of work together, cite each other. Although we haven't gone in depth to study each of this, uh, smaller collaboration groups, but we, we know that there's going to be something along those lines that will speak to the broader uh, biases that we saw. And in conclusion, uh, the summary of what we took out is that white voices continue to be centered in academic research, even on the matters of segregation. 
and my marginalization of knowledge from black scholars and other authors of color is also predominant in the in the research community and understanding that there's a difference about approach to questions about school segregation and there's also a difference in the response. So with this, I want to thank the the Prison Social and Thought Fellowship at the Mos that, uh, Muslim, uh Foundation for sponsoring the research. This was truly an eye opener. Uh, working with Professor Louis McCoy, Professor Sonia Douglas, and Professor Ying, it was really an enjoyable experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing work. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a fantastic hour plus. <laughs> Thank you for everyone who showed up and who even stayed 10 minutes over. That's um, really appreciated. Um, this is our last uh, PRISM seminar of the year, our formal one, but we will start up again in the fall. So uh, I hope that some of you who this may have been your first time with us will join us again in the fall. And thanks to all the PIs and to all of the fellows and to Moore Sloan for providing this experience.